Good evening. Now, just before I start, I just want to ask, how many of you here have ever backed a crowdfunded project? Maybe Indiegogo, Kickstarter, something, ooh, quite a few. Now, of those of you who have, who's backed a product? Something like a watch, a beer cooler, you give them your money, when the product's ready, they send you one. Quite a few. Anyone backed a project maybe a little bit less tangible than that? Uh, something like a film project, uh, maybe some scientific research, maybe the grid. Okay. And has anyone backed a billion dollar moon mission lately? <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. The rest of you, we can talk later. So, first, let me tell you a little bit about Lunar Mission 1, so you can see what we're trying to do here. Now, Lunar Mission 1 is a non-profit um, mission to the moon. It's not all crowdfunded, but it started out with crowdfunding. Lunar Mission 1 is going to go to the moon, and it's going to help us answer some really big questions. Questions like how the moon was born. Now, we think we know how the moon was born. We think that about four and a half billion years ago, uh, an object called Theia, which is about half the size of the Earth, slammed in, kind of into the side of a very young, soft Earth, knocked a chunk off. That debris then coalesced, started orbiting the moon, uh, sorry, uh, orbiting the Earth, and that became our moon. It's also entirely possible that what was left of Theia went off to become the planet Mercury. Well, we think so, but we're not entirely sure, because that theory, the giant impact theory of how the moon was born, has never been proven. And the other theories of how the moon were born have never been disproven. So, we're going to send a, a lander to the moon, to the South Pole, um, to find out. And it's an area that's far from where the Apollo missions landed, so it's never been explored. But there is lots of sunlight there, and we're going to need the sunlight because we're going to drill deep, up to 100 meters into the moon, and analyze the rocks, and see what the geology is like, and see where the moon came from. Now, just as an aside, once we've done the drilling, that creates the perfect little hidey hole with stable temperatures and no humidity to place an archive. So that's what we're going to do. In fact, two archives. One official archive of life on Earth, and one collection of possibly millions of personal, private, digital archives. But more about that later. The drilling will enable us to find out what the moon is made of and answer some very big questions about the moon, the Earth, and the rest of the solar system, and how they were born. Now, while we're there, we can also take some other experiments to help out other projects. We might be able to recce the moon to see how much water ice is there, how much water is in the mineralogy of the moon. We might be able to tell if it's good for a radio astronomy base, or even for a manned base in the future. So, our, that project was started in 2007, and I'm one of the five original trustees. And originally, we aimed to kick off Lunar Mission 1 with a seed fund loan of a few hundred thousand pounds. But all the loans we had access to at that time were somehow linked to the government, and government funding has been very tight. So, at one point, I'd get a a call to number 10 Downing Street and think, yes, this is it, we've got the funding. And then I'd hear that it had been reallocated and that we hadn't got the funding. Um, and that's just the way it goes. But we got to the stage where we still hadn't got the funding and we were ready to go. It was all planned on paper, something needed to happen. And that seed loan hadn't got to us, we were stuck. We already had so many amazing people on board. Rutherford Appleton Laboratories, uh, the Open University, and you might know that the Open University are responsible for a lot of the amazing science on the Rosetta mission. Uh, UCL, who have got an amazing space department. The space agencies knew we were revved up and ready to go, and we couldn't let that momentum and support just 
fizzle out. So I'll never forget the meeting where we all sat around and said, you know what, we've just got to do this anyway. But how are we going to make that happen? So we had a talk about alternative forms of funding, and crowdfunding was one of those. I'd backed projects before, but I'd never used it to raise money. And the more I looked at it, the more I wondered why. You might not know, but crowdfunding in the UK is absolutely nothing new. The Great Exhibition of 1851 was crowdfunded. The uh, committees raised £232,000 from people like you and me. Now, that might sound not might sound like a lot, but in today's money, that's £28 million from ordinary people, uh, done by local committee because the internet hadn't quite been invented yet. But that was enough money to build the Crystal Palace, which was at the time the largest covered structure on the planet. And that housed the exhibition. The exhibition ran successfully for six months. People came not only from all over the UK, but from all over the world. And in fact, the exhibition was so successful that it raised a surplus in today's money of 18 million pounds. And that was enough to build the Science Museum, the v &A, the Natural History Museum, and the Royal Commission is still managing that trust fund today. So that was pretty ambitious, right? But it's just not the normal way to fund a space mission. The traditionalists in the space industry said that if we crowdfunded, we would be a laughing stock that no serious scientists would ever work for us, that the space agencies would run screaming from us. And anyway, it, it was all a technicality because the public were not ready to fund a serious, full-on space mission. So, on the 19th of November 2014, just over a year ago, we launched our Kickstarter campaign. We asked for $1 million, that's 600,000 pounds. Our main reward that we offered was for, for anybody who wanted one to send a digital time capsule, their own cache of stuff, to the moon to be placed in the borehole for up to a billion years. So, what happened? Well, the first thing that happened was on launch day, the media went absolutely crazy. We were all over the BBC, ITN, uh, Fox, CNN, ABC, Huff Post, Mashable, Wired, that lot. In fact, pretty much everything from the New York Times to TN8 in Nicaragua, who I'd actually never even heard of before. During the first day, we handled 800 media stories. People like the moon. During the first few days, we were really lucky. So many celebrities and scientists came out to support us. Professor Stephen Hawking said that Lunar Mission 1 has the power to rekindle our wonder. And that's just a short quote from a lovely piece that he wrote on his personal Facebook page for us. Professor Brian Cox said this, for me, an exciting thing about Lunar Mission 1 is that everyone can play a part directly in the funding. That they can know that they've given this money and that money is going to go into the technology which is going to land on the moon, it's going to do the science. You can also uh, put, your, put your memories, a little archive of your life in Lunar Mission 1 if you want, and it'll land on the moon and it'll sit there for a billion years, which is a nice thing to think about. But I think the key thing for me is that everybody can say, I think we should explore space. I want to increase the sum total of human knowledge, I want to know how the solar system formed. It's important, and so I am going to do something about it. I'm going to pay for it. And that's exciting. Thank you, Brian. So Paul McCartney had a time capsule in his name. In his case, he wanted to protest against animal cruelty to show that the world in the 21st century isn't perfect. And space rockers Underground Zero announced their intention to place their entire 30-year back catalogue of space rock in space rock. See what they did there. 
um, they were going to use their time capsule as a music archive. And thousands of people bought time capsules to preserve their photography, their family tree, their music, their art, their top secret chocolate cake recipe. Our youngest supporter was just nine months old. Our oldest supporter got her time capsule for her 93rd birthday, and she's sending her DNA to the moon in the form of a strand of hair. We got 36% of our funding on the first day. Now, here's a graph of the Kickstarter income. <laughs> I am told that's a fairly typical graph for a crowdfunded project. So if you are thinking of crowdfunding, don't ever think your first day is going to be a typical day. But did we get the money we asked for? Oh, yes. In fact, instead of 600,000, we got 672,447 pounds, which kind of blew us away a bit. But what really blew us away was the sheer support of the backers that came with us. Because Lunar Mission One was always hoped to be the most inclusive, interactive, engaging space mission ever. It always had a big public engagement and public education plan, um, a campaign planned. And, and that's why I was asked to join Lunar Mission One. I'm not a space specialist. I'm a science generalist. But Lunar Mission One isn't all about space. The archive side of things is amazing, to send an archive of life on Earth to the moon. So it's about getting people all over the world to collaborate and to start a global conversation. What should go in that archive? What would you put in your private archive? to send to the moon for people to see in millions of years. So from that campaign, we got 7,300 people in 60 countries all over the world in one month flat. And we're gaining new supporters every day as they find us. Now, had this been a government-funded project, I just don't think people would have engaged with it like they did. Possibly not for years, in fact. But because we were brave and we went out there and said, look, do you want us to do this? They just absolutely blew us away with their support and showed that they were ready to back a space mission. More than ready. Because they didn't want to just give us their money and then get their time capsule software and sit back and wait for the launch. They wanted to get actively involved in the mission. And so they have. Our backers have now decided to call themselves the Luminauts. They have formed a group. They have Facebooked for us, tweeted for us. They have written music, done art, jewelry, poetry. They have volunteered to fundraise. Um, they've just generally been so completely awesome. We don't know how to begin thanking them. And we didn't know that that would happen. One artist has even set up an entire web gallery dedicated to Lunar Mission One. It's called the Lunar Mission Gallery. This is a piece of Mike D'Souza's art, and you're listening to a piece of his music. Some of our supporters are writing apps for us because they happen to be professional app developers. Some of them are writing blogs, and some of those are professional journalists. Some people are volunteering to work with us in their holidays, and some educational professionals and teachers are helping us to design and implement our education program. They are just utterly amazing. So, where are we right now? Well, the Kickstarter program paid for the prep stage, and that got us off paper. We now have a mission team, we have a project team, we have a science team, we have an education team, as well as the website. We're now into the setup stage in Space Talk. And what that actually means is we've got to start identifying the technologies that we're going to take to the moon and use what kind of a drill, and that kind of thing. We've got a good idea, but it has to be narrowed down, and it all has to be proven. It's also hot news to be on the moon right now. 
Um, the moon is really hot stuff because it's just been announced that there's a volcano on the moon called the Mafic Mound, catchy name, that could be an entirely new kind of volcano never seen before. There's also just been announced a joint European and Russian mission to the moon in about five years' time to drill down to about two meters. And about five years after that, we hope to drill down possibly as much as 100 meters. So in about 10 years' time, we hope to be not only celebrating a launch and looking forward to finding out some of the answers about the birth of the moon and the Earth and the solar system, but we're looking forward to celebrating that with thousands or possibly millions of people around the world who actually helped make it happen, and who are sending their own time capsule to be found in the far, far future. Now, if you just think for one minute how excited we get when somebody uncovers a little cache of Victorian stuff that's just over 100 years old, really, or a load of um, Roman artifacts that are only a couple of thousand years old, can you imagine what it would be like for people in millions of years' time to uncover a capsule showing what life was like in the 21st century. Now, I'm building my time capsule with my partner and my daughter, who's seven. And even if space doesn't float your boat, I think there's something really amazing about a space project that can leave a legacy like that, and that can get people all over the world collaborating and talking together about what they're going to put in their time capsule and what should go in the main archive. So the individuals, the families, the schools may only be building their own little time capsule, but together they are going to build the most vivid and realistic picture of life on Earth as it truly is that has ever been created. And the conversations to do that are going to be utterly amazing. Schools comparing lives with each other. And if ever there was a time when we wanted people around the world to engage in friendly and positive conversation with each other, surely now is the time we want that to happen. And that is why I am truly proud to be a member of Lunar Mission One. Thank you.